It's my privilege to welcome you here. Uh, those of you who brought the elements, I'm told we actually have more people joining us by web webcast than who are physically present. And um, that may reflect the weather. Also reflecting the weather is the fact that Tom Miller is still stuck in traffic, but he tells us he's, um, he, can, uh, he can see the building. So on um, the fact that we've uh, passed the visual sighting test, we're gonna get going. Um, our panel today is, is uh, those folks who are with you alphabetically uh, on the sheet you have. And uh, we're gonna go in a slightly different order, starting off with my uh, Hudson uh, colleague, Tebby. We're gonna go down the, the row here with my Hudson colleague, Tebby Troy, Jim Capretta, uh, Tom Miller, who will dazzle us with his PowerPoint slides, he promises, um, Nina Otorenko, and then finally, um, pulling it in from the far left, <laughs> Doug Badger. Tebby. Thanks, Hans, and thanks for all your work in organizing this event. Hans and I were talking about this event uh, a couple of weeks ago when we it, the, uh, the writing seemed to be on the wall that there would be a, a new Republican House majority, uh, but we weren't sure. So our, our, my initial title for this event was Healthcare <coughs> Advice to Speaker slash Leader Boehner. But the, uh, the suits wouldn't let me go with that title. They thought it was a little too risky. Maybe Al came in might say something nasty about us. So uh, for being too presumptuous. So uh, we, we, we went with, with the, the current title. Uh, but the whole idea was assuming that uh, the Republicans would have a very good night, which they did, um, and that their leader, minority leader Boehner would become Speaker Boehner. Uh, what advice could we give him that he actually might listen to? And we intentionally set it up. You, know, you usually have these think tank fora, um, and Lord knows I've been to many of them in my day. There's you know, one or two from the right and one or two from the left. And you kind of have some kind of split um, decision and you kind of work it out from left and right. But m my thought for this particular event is that the conversation really is on the right. And the conversation about what Speaker Boehner is gonna do and what the new House majority is gonna do is among the right. And it's among the people here you see at this, at this table, these people who are gonna be providing the advice. And so that's why we specifically went with the, uh, the, heads, uh, the, the healthcare advisors from, uh, from four of the top think tanks or the top conservative think tank in, in DC. And so that was the kind of the conception of, of the panel. Now, when I started going to uh, think tank panels uh, as, a, as a young pup, I remember uh, there'd always be some guy who would kind of adjust his tie. I'm not actually wearing a tie, but um, who would adjust his tie to, when I worked at the White House, and, and then give some, uh, uh, you know, some homily about his, his time at the White House. And uh, I thought, well, you know, why do they always have to do that? Why have to they make that point that, oh, yeah, they worked at the White House, blah, blah, blah. But for this particular uh, purpose, I do actually have to make that point. And say, uh, w when I was at the White House, uh, we would have smart people like uh, Jim, who worked with me at the White House, and, and, and Dean, and people like that, um, who would come up with all these great policy ideas and brilliant suggestions and just ways to change the whole paradigm and shift everything. And then you would always have one guy in the room who would say, eh, that's not going to happen. And that guy was someone from the Office of Legislative Affairs. Usually it was Doug Badger. <laughs> so um, uh, Doug is not a, uh, a frequenter of, of think tank panels. Um, For obvious reasons. But, but uh, <laughs> well, uh, we'll see. He's, he's so good, he'll, he'll blow the rest of us away. But um, the, the, um, the idea was that there was always somebody who's saying, well, you know, you have these great ideas, but it's not going to happen. You have to look at the legislative reality. And so, uh, so Doug here is to, to um, bring up the legislative reality. And that's not to say that we in the policy world were not cognizant of those. I mean, we would say, oh, well, there's this no many Republicans, there's this many Democrats in this committee split this way or that way. But the, these guys at OLA, the Office of Legislative Affairs, would have kind of a an understanding of the legislative process that just wasn't available to the rest of us mere mortal. And so that's why we decided to take the, the four policy experts uh, and Hans, and um, who's also a policy expert and moderator, but then have but but then add the Office of Legislative uh, Affairs expertise in, in Doug Badger. So that, that's the conception behind the panel. And the framing question really is, what now? I mean, it seems pretty clear to all of us that uh, perhaps everyone except President Obama that the Republicans ran on this notion that the health care bill was problematic and not popular, and President Obama kind of refused to acknowledge that in his press conference yesterday, but the rest of the country, even the news media, kind of acknowledged that in terms of in asking him that question yesterday about, uh, you know, isn't this appear to be a repudiation of your health care bill? And so given the, that the, um, the Republicans certainly interpret the election that way, and I think it's a, a fair interpretation, they have to go do something about it. And it seems clear to me that one of the first things they're going to do, and, and uh, majority leader to be Eric Cantor actually said something along these lines, that there is going to be a vote 
in the House uh, very early on in the new session to repeal the health care bill, straight up repeal. Now, I think all of us at this panel, uh, we don't even have to be Doug Badgers to acknowledge that that bill will probably pass the House, but it's not going to go through the Senate because the Democrats, A, have a majority, and even if they didn't retain a majority, they probably couldn't get through a filibuster. And B, even if we were to get through that point, President Obama still retains the veto pen, and I think he's going to be exercising that pen a lot more in the next two years than he did in the first two years. So given that, there is going to be a symbolic uh, re repeal vote that will probably pass but not become law. What do Republicans do next? And the way I see it, there really are three options. Option one is do nothing. Right? We say we tried a repeal. We couldn't get it. Let's wait till the next Congress when there's a Republican president potentially and then, and then try it. I think that is unrealistic largely because of this. There was such a, an anti-health care reform wave that sent, um, sent, sent some of these people to Congress. Uh, second option is to try and repeal chunks of the bill, perhaps the most egregious or most offensive or uh, most problematic controversial pieces of it. Uh, one thing that I know a lot of people have been talking about is the 1099 provision. That is the burdensome paperwork requirement that says that uh, small businesses or any businesses have to fill out paperwork and send it to the IRS whenever they give $600 or more to a, um, uh, to a single vendor. That would mean that if I were to take out this illustrious group for uh, a steak dinner and um, charge it to an LLC, I would have to send a, um, a 1099 uh, to, to Charlie Palmer's or wherever we went for dinner because uh, that, would, that would probably, given this group, probably eat up to $600 pretty quickly. So that, that is a burdensome requirement. A lot of people recognize that, it, that it's problematic. And, um, and, and I think if the Republicans wanted to go that way, they could get rid of the, the 1099 provisions and, and others. Uh, at the same time, there's a danger to that. If you get rid of the really most egregious, most offensive provisions, you may be left with provisions that are not as easily uh, defeatable and would be harder to make the case for repeal after 2012. So the third option is, is kind of what I call guerrilla warfare, which is where you try and uh, harass, maybe harass isn't the right word, but, but try and ask questions about the implementation of the bill, which would include uh, perhaps uh, funding limitations. It would include using the new investigatory tools that Republicans have now that they're in the majority uh, with, with all of the um, congressional bodies that can do investigations. You know, I, I noticed um, that some Republicans were using CRS, the Congressional Research Service, to do some of their uh, investigative questions over the last couple of, of months. Um, it, you know, I admire their resourcefulness, but, but CRS doesn't have the kind of power, the investigative power that a, a GAO does or a, C, or, a, or a number crunching ability that a CBO does. So the, the Republicans will have a lot more tools to do these kinds of investigations. They will also have the, the uh, majority ship in the, in the panels and the, uh, the committees, and they will have a gavel and subpoena power, which will help. And then there's also the, the possibility of appropriations riders to limit funding for certain implementation aspects. And that could, I think, continue to frame the argument about why they think the health care bill is bad and problematic, and also perhaps slow down the implementation so that the entire bill is not a fait accompli by the time there is the next potential for a Republican president after the 2012 election. Uh, there is another option that's not really a congressional option. I'll, I'll let uh, Tom Miller probably do the talking about it. It's something that he mentioned in his Wall Street Journal op-ed, which is really encouraging the states to uh, implement the health care reform bill in a, in a more... Um, market-friendly and consumer-friendly way and make sure that there, um, that there are kind of uh, more choices out there available to consumers through the exchanges and then kind of dare the federal government not to uh, let them proceed with it. Um, I, I don't consider that in my main three options because that's not really a congressional option. But those are, are really the, the, the three options as I see it. As I said, number one, doing nothing is not viable. Number two has a huge political risk to it. Uh, President Obama said he was open to tweaks yesterday in his press conference, but he also laid it out in such a way that indicated that he would uh, take a very jaundiced eye towards those tweaks. He said, if the Republicans come up with something that is so great and overwhelming and uh, would really reform the system, then I'd be willing to take a look at it. Um, that, that's sort of a, what I call a, a non-apology apology. You know, I'm, I'm sorry if I offended you. I mean, it's not really a showing a willingness to, to look at Republican ideas, you know, only if they're so great and fantastic that he'd never thought of them before. So, uh, so, so option number two has its difficulties, although I'll see, we may see some of it, but, but I think most of the action over the next, uh, at least the first six months of this new Congress after the initial symbolic repeal passes is going to be option three, which is the, the, the sort of um, in investigations, um, 
uh, funding limitations and, and hearings approach and, and, um, and perhaps to set up the argument for the 2012 uh, election about why Republicans want to see the health care bill go away. Thank you. Jim. Oh, well, thank you very much. Um, well, first, thanks Hans and Tevi for inviting me to be here. Uh, very pleased to have this kind of conversation, actually. Uh, because it gives us, uh, you know, a certain amount of hope that uh, health policy could be moving in a different direction um, with a lot of work ahead. But uh, at least there's some hope that uh, political leadership, uh, I think, will be open to uh, new ideas and new ways of going at it than they were in the last couple of years. So uh, there, there's a new hope here, I think, of actually instituting some, some reforms eventually. Uh, I, like uh, Tevi, I, I didn't hear it from Speaker Boehner. I was... I, so many flood of information in the last couple of days. I, I heard it from Congressman Eric Cantor that they did plan to bring up and pass a straight repeal uh, uh, bill very early in the new Congress. I think. Did you say Cantor? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I thought you said Boehner. So uh, yeah, I heard. I guess I heard the same thing then. And uh, the uh, I think that's terrific. I mean, obviously they should do that. And because it lays down a marker about where the new uh, House majority stands, uh, it sends a signal to the people that put them in power that they're going to keep faith with uh, them in terms of their priorities. Uh, it, you know, it really needs to happen. Um, now, having said that, um, I think the interesting conversation really is what happens. Part of, you know, uh, an interesting conversation is what happens after that. Because as all the reasons Tevi laid out, um, that's not the end of it. And what I, when people ask me about this, I usually say, you know, this was always going to be a long war, right? Right after the bill passed, um, I wrote a piece essentially with that title. This is a long war, and uh, the decisive battle is very likely to be the 2012 uh, presidential contest. Uh, from my point of view, the ultimate goal of full repeal with replacement of an alternative program seems unlikely to occur totally unless we have a Republican presidential candidate who runs explicitly on a credible, workable, viable replacement program and wins. And at that point, you would have a public mandate to really take the bill out fully, root it out entirely, and replace it with a consumer-directed market-based system. Um, that's a tall order, obviously. So uh, there's still a huge amount of work that needs to be done. The House especially needs to understand, I think, that that's the ultimate goal. That they, the things they do need to keep faith with the voters who sent them, they need to engage in a lot of activity, however, that lay the foundation for building up to a, the ultimate fight, which will be to present to the American public as part of a big decision in 2012, a full replacement program that actually would bring better health care, less burdensome to our budget and our economy, that would give people a lot of security and would address the cost issue. So all of those things are needed to get to the ultimate goal, I believe. Now, that still leaves us, though, with uh, the current, the current uh, situation for the 112th Congress, which is a new, very uh, robust House majority that's opposed to the law, and a president and a smaller Democratic, Democratic majority in the Senate that are supportive of it. And so what, what to do there? Um, and here, I guess my... Um, my advice is to um, to the new majority would be to resist the temptation to do what I think the Democrats did when they uh, took power, which was to essentially say, as the President Obama more or less did say with a stimulus bill, "Hey, the train's leaving the station. Either you get you get on the train, or we're going to leave you behind." And of course, the Republicans took a pass. They passed the stimulus bill all on their own. It's now ridiculed from coast to coast. 
and seen as an abject failure such that the entire Democratic Party essentially ran against it in the last election. So I don't think we're going to make the same mistake, but what I, my, my, my uh, point is that on things like health care in particular, and even in budget policy and entitlement reform, there is, it, it's much better to build a coalition of the center and the right for durable, long-lasting reforms than it is to go for short-term victories that can later be overturned by the other side. And I say that because many of the things in the healthcare arena are uh, quite difficult to achieve, in part because they, you know, do t they do tend to create some winners and losers. And, you know, to get long-lasting reforms, you need centrist Democrats, probably, to go along with some of your ideas. So I would try to build bridges, not necessarily directly with the White House at the beginning, but actually to kind of, frankly, to isolate the White House. I think they're going to be defenders of the status quo. And, you know, the Republican majority could do great things in the House if they also reach out to some of the conservative Democrats, however many remain, and bring them into a coalition to go for a number of targeted changes to the bill, even over the next two years. And these are not necessarily things that would actually make it past the president still, but I think beginning to show that there's a bipartisan coalition in support of some of these things would be very valuable for uh, the long run uh, goal. And a few of the things I thought I would bring up, uh, just a couple of ideas that might fit into that kind of a category. Um, first, why not pass a, a standalone provision that is essentially you might call it the you can keep it if you like it amendment uh, which essentially says to the uh, employer community that uh, they don't have to make any changes if they're currently offering health insurance to their workers and paying premiums on behalf of their workers uh, they don't have to change anything they can just stick with that in perpetuity as long as the Obama reg care regime is going online in 2014 so they don't have to comply with all of the other stuff. It would mean that nobody actually, this would actually kind of keep faith with the presidential promise. If you like what you have, you can keep it. Um, put that into action with a, um, a provision that essentially begins to exempt employers from having to do anything if they don't want to. Um, the second uh, thing I, you know, you could put out there is on Medicare Advantage. I think it was probably clear from the election returns that uh, the nation's seniors were not very happy with the health care law, and I think Medicare Advantage is one big reason that they, many seniors understand that that's going to get disrupted in the next few years from many of the cuts that are in the bill. Uh, why not delay those cuts for the current Congress, the upcoming Congress? So for 2011 and 2012, those cuts are scheduled to start taking, go deeper and deeper in Medicare Advantage. Why not just delay them to 2013 after the next presidential election? And as an offset, uh, say that because these cuts aren't going to go into effect, we actually also have to downsize or delay some of the spending in the bill. So just delay and postpone the initiation of some of the uh, subsidy programs. Um, Another one that's on the list is the Independent Payment Advisory Board. Uh, this is the 15-member um, unaccountable advisory board that HAL has sort of unilateral authority to make payment policy recommendations in the Medicare program. Very controversial. Um, you know, lots of people say, well, if, if it's just mandate was just broad and to actually restructure Medicare, it'd be a great idea. Well. I'm not sure it's ever going to get there. I mean, I think what we have here now is is the ability to unilaterally impose price controls through this board, and I'm not really for that. So I think uh, the Republican House could also put a straight repeal of the IPAB on the table, and I'm pretty sure it would draw significant Democratic support as well. Uh, also in the bill, there's a new organization, um, a, new, a new entity created in the bill called Accountable Care Organizations. These are the organizations that um, essentially are government-encouraged HMOs that will be run by 
hospitals and doctors instead of uh, insurance companies. But they're going to be like HMOs nonetheless. They'll be managed care, essentially, in the Medicare program. Uh, but it's, there's a really interesting uh, provision in the, in the law that I don't think has gotten much discussion, which is how does someone end up in one of these accountable care organizations? Uh, and it turns out the way they plan to do it is to assign them to it. They're just going to put Medicare beneficiaries into these ACOs, as they're called, uh, based on their pattern of use of physician services. If they go to a certain doctor as their primary care physician predominantly, and that doctor is a member of the ACO, then by default, the plan is to put the beneficiary into the ACO. So you're going to have essentially Medicare beneficiaries ending up into an HMO environment with lots of government strictures about how the HMO is run, and they may not even know it. A, they may not even know it, and B, they certainly didn't necessarily agree to it. So why not a straight provision that just essentially says that no beneficiary can be placed into an ACO without their consent and their um, agreement? I think that would bring to light a lot of sort of the government engineered aspect of this that is not going to uh, be very attractive to the public. Um, and finally, and then I'll quit so I, other can go, is uh, I do think it would be uh, beneficial to have a, a straight provision that essentially allows the states to um, really uh, do much, have much more flexibility around all aspects of what's going on. Um, so that uh, instead of, uh, I think Senator Hatch has introduced a bill that said whatever they do is allowable. <laughs> I'm not sure you can get away with that. But, um, you know, something along the lines of, you know, the states are really the drivers of reform, not the federal government. Um, all of this, I, I, I do agree with Tevi's point, which is that you don't want to improve the bill. I don't want to, this, this bill is unredeemable, okay? But I think each of these can be pursued, draw bipartisan support, bipartisan support, and begin to lay down markers about what a full replace the kind of principles a full replacement program would be built upon. And uh, they would also make it clear to the public that there are some serious problems with the existing law. Thank you. Thank you. One of the great artists of PowerPoint, Tom Miller. <laughs> Okay, well, let's see whether it's up here or not. Uh, I, I do have to say that the meter is running for me, both literally and figuratively, not only <laughs> on the clock here, but right outside the building. Um, it, it is going to run short. I'll be increasing the uh, revenue base of the D.C. government shortly. Um, another case of taxation. If anyone has quarters, we'll, we'll, For those of us please. who came in from Northern Virginia. Quarter contribution will be fine. It's literally right outside the door. Okay, you good, just good. plug it right in. Um, are we up yet? Yeah. Over there. Oh, over oh, there. oh, I'm left. That's right. I'm, I never looked to my left. Sorry. Isn't that a surprise? <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, well, you know, I, I assume usually following uh, Jim Capretta uh, that he's given a very thoughtful, extensive analysis uh, enough to complete each other's sentences. Uh, so there's, there's less need to be substantive. Uh, although, although Jim did stop a little bit at uh, let's get back to the status quo with some signals eventually we'll get to somewhere else. Uh, but, you know, there aren't many new ideas, new, new ideas in this field. I think most of the folks in the panel could complete each other's sentences in terms of their policy recommendations. What was once cutting edge uh, becomes essentially uh, conventional wisdom, even if it's not enacted into law. Uh, we all can pretend to be, uh, you know, semi-professional politicians. Uh, but there is a tension between uh, what might be novel uh, and intriguing in a theoretical sense, yet still remains uh, understandable and workable in the rest of the world. Plus, I can't uh, trump what we've got as our own Beyond Repeal and Replacement a project coming out later on this month, uh, so I can't give away the store entirely. But let's uh, take a quick overview as to where we are. First, we've got the day after the Democrats' reaction, the Edward Munch, uh, the scream, if you recall your uh, late 19th century, early 20th century art history. Um, we also, though, uh, have, going back a couple of decades ago, the basic Tea Party reaction, uh, Howard Beale, a forerunner of this. Uh, I didn't check and open my window, but I do believe there was uh, plenty of mad as hell uh, yelling in that front and not taking it anymore. That's the basics. On the other hand, things can get a little bit out of control. If you recall from Young Frankenstein, uh, the moment when uh, the monster uh, got on the loose and the townsfolks were assembled uh, with their various torches and uh, pitchforks, 
Uh, Inspector Kemp, that's Kenneth Mars there with both a monocle and an eye patch over the same <laughs> eye, I might point out. He also played the uh, Nazi uh, in uh, the uh, producers, uh, <laughs> suggesting that uh, in a very thick German accent, which I won't give, do justice to, a riot is an ugly thing, and I think that it's just about time they had fun, which is essentially uh, where we are in the political sense, because from the viewpoint of the elites, the peasants are revolting, uh, they stink on ice, uh, and that's just a mid-afternoon shot with the torches, just to tell what they do there. Now, there's an older strategy, uh, which was going to work until uh, things changed in terms of the landscape, which is if you go back to the late 1940s, uh, Mao had this about right in terms of first taking the countryside and then encircling the cities. Uh, it worked uh, on, on the long march in that regard, but now that some of the folks have actually taken over the cities, we begin to lose interest in what's going out in the countryside uh, beyond Washington, D.C. Now, there's also a uh, annual ritual in, uh, it shows up in the Washington Post on January 1st. Uh, it's the list of what's in and what's out. I'm going to give you an abbreviated version of this for the, uh, see here, oh, I'm oh, sorry, old flash effects there. Uh, what's out and what's in for the 112th Congress, I'll only highlight a few. You'll have to read along or check it on later. Uh, we have the firewalls and the exchange uh, subsidies, uh, but now we've got investigations and probably stone walls in response. Uh, bronze plan minimums in the exchange plans. My favorite, of course, are zirconium plans. Uh, they almost look as good as bronze, but are much cheaper. Uh, and of course, uh, at the very bottom, uh, we've got uh, out Botox treatments in tanning boots. Uh, actually, Jim mentioned ACOs, Accountable Care Organization. I have that on the list. Uh, what's in accountable political organizations, APOs, perhaps. Uh, got some more, though. Um, among these, uh, expert theories out, uh, proof in practice in. We could try that for a, a while. Uh, roadkill of future generations out in roadmap uh, for a different approach to the budget and the rest of the programs. And finally, out, you break it, in, you own it. I think you know who uh, has been visiting the Pottery Barn. Uh, okay, uh, some reprogramming. Uh, there's a lot of good ideas, you know, or at least names of programs, same name, new mission. We could swap them around so people can go with the familiar. Cap and trade, let's apply it to limiting and reallocating tax subsidies uh, for health insurance. A medical home, combine that with what we still have as a bit of a uh, inventory. So sell off those houses in foreclosure to mini clinic operators. Uh, certificate of need, let's apply it to government health programs or regulations as opposed to the way it's worked in the past. Midnight basketball from the Clinton era. Uh, you got folks out there can be entertained, but also some emergency personnel on, on standby, and you can bring folks over to handle uh, spillover capacity in the late night situation. Uh, a couple more in this regard. Uh, agricultural set-asides or conservation reserves do that more in Europe than we do these days, but we can at least pay the top 100 Academy Health researchers to stop publishing more policy advice. Uh, it'll be a real worthwhile trade. Now, we have tips for the Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. We could have a new class of investment. You might want to call them MIPS, Medical Inflation Protected Security. Uh, the medical loss ratio, uh, some would require everyone to spend at least 80% of their income on health care services. Why just insurers? And, of course, the Apollo program to fly planet metal malpractice trial lawyers back to the moon. All right, I thought Tevi was going to talk about his small bill. This is the 1977 uh, Steve Martin approach to let's get small. Uh, I had to enlarge the slide for this. Uh, also, I think it included some accelerated drug trials in that particular era of the mid-1970s. Uh, I, I guess I have to get substantive for a minute. Uh, just a minute. Uh, real health reforms. Uh, there's, a, there's a medley of these, but basically it's alternative risk protection packages. If you're going to strip away what is the uh, insurance and other regulatory labyrinth, that uh, the uh, PPACA has. Uh, there's a medley of these things. You've got different settings, but whether it's more extensively funded high-risk pools that Jim and I have written about, uh, continuous coverage incentives, you get the protections if you stay continuously insured. Some front-end rules for pools are a lot more exotic and, and harder to do in a voluntary sustained manner, but you could do that without having them automatically set the wrong way. Uh, competition and entry would help a little bit. Uh, interstate sales, uh, domicile-based regulation is one way to open the market beyond state boundary lines, at least squeeze out the outliers. Uh, a little harder to do, we've concentrated hospital markets, there's at least some early theories as to allow some a la carte purchasing by buyers. You basically have to use, which I don't normally like to break the glass for antitrust doctrine, because it's a dangerous weapon, but if buyers there, you can do anti-tying doctrine to try that. 
uh, in the whole area of data aggregation, important, some common measures, but still allows some room for competitive shots at different types of performance measurement for outcomes and experience. Forget about the process stuff, which everybody does because it's easy. Uh, AWB, AWS is any willing buyer, any willing seller. Uh, and Medicare competitive bidding, not the narrow competitive bidding, but the old stuff from the late 90s, which is how to actually have level playing field competition for insurance plans in Medicare without lining some pockets a little bit more, as uh, we've done on occasion. Uh, lower subsidies uh, spread uh, based, though, more on uh, sensitive to income and risk. I, I think the flat crude thing doesn't really work. Uh, Jim and I will talk a little bit later on this month about the fine contribution, uh, but still no net tax increases if you're moving around the dials. Uh, if you get pushed harder, but it's getting a little bit too directed to have some front-end unsubsidized cost sharing without tax subsidies. But most of all, no mo mo, that's maintenance of effort uh, for Medicaid in the states. Uh, focus on also, though, on occasion, the 90% of avoidable mortality factors that are not influenced by healthcare services. That'd be an interesting approach as opposed to what we spend all our attention to and decentralize the level at which mistakes are made. All right, I guess I was asked to come here to talk about health benefits exchanges and I will at least give some lip service to that uh, effort. Uh, what Scott Gottlieb and I wrote about in the Wall Street Journal, these other thoughts in this front, we didn't invent this, uh, an alternative model of health benefits exchanges, they actually exist in some places like Utah, basically information heavy, disclosure heavy, regulation light. Uh, now states have a lot more leverage before 2014 than people imagine before the dollars start flowing out. We've got a spate of new governors coming in, a chance to put something on the ground in the field, not extensive, but uh, at least something there is an alternative path that suggests some positive action. Say you got a problem with this, what do you want to do about it? Uh, structural choke points, though, in how you set it up, how you handle inside versus outside plans. My recommendations is if the state had a certain set of insurance rules for outside plans, apply them to the exchange. Don't go in reverse. That's the whole idea of setting policies at the state level. Uh, keep the insurance regulation elsewhere than not within the uh, exchange administration. A generous uh, definition of actuarial equivalence along the lines of what we did in Part D eventually uh, to compare plans, give information about it, but don't censor choices. And in the uh, French sense, uh, you can have a wide menu without the fixed prices or price fixing, as the case may be. Uh, and watch out for the integrated eligibility determinations. If you don't have your own exchange, the feds are going to tell you how your Medicaid program runs and everything else over the course of time. So what's the outlook on this reform front? Cloudy with a chance of thunder showers, but no meatballs. Uh, we all know that the permanent law still has the high ground until it gets displaced. Um, when even fast this. Oh, by the way, I wanted to say, in terms of the uh, the exchanges, we want to put civility back into civil disobedience uh, in that regard. So it's just a, it's a it's a modest opposition at the state level. Um, we have to downsize uh, expectations for what we can do in health policy, upsize uh, responsibilities beyond what government can do. Uh, remember, though, in all this stuff, administrability, we've already got an incredibly unworkable concoction of things. And so, if you come up with your favorite toy or favorite plan but you can't explain how it'll actually get implemented and carried out. You need to rethink it a little bit. Uh, abstractions do not translate or sustain well in the larger public, even though they seem great when I wrote them up. Uh, and the only majority political position at the moment thus far is give me everything and don't charge me anything for it. But that's not something that anyone can afford or implement. We can imagine it, of course, and the overall economy trumps all. Um, if you want a little bit more substance on this, though, discuss among yourselves. I've got a piece out today, or actually yesterday in Forbes.com, running through some of the more elaborate options, as well as what we did with uh, the exchanges and uh, earlier work on the pre-ex conditions and uh, a different approach. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nina. It's always hard to follow Tom Miller, so <laughs> a little bit back to uh, the vanilla ice cream approach here. Slow uh, down on my southern That's right. Maybe I'll pull out a speech. southern draw, and that'll get people's attention. Um, well, I first want to say, finally, the American people's opposition to the process and the policies that were enacted were heard. We know during the entire uh, debate that not only were the American people um, uh, opposed and upset with the way that the bill was handled, but we also had bipartisan opposition to the bill. So that's always important to remember. Um, the American people know it. Why? Because businesses knew what was going to happen. They have new mandates, taxes, regulations. You couldn't hide that in the 2,000 pages as much as they wanted to. The businesses read it and they figured it out. The seniors, as Jim has already mentioned, um, were very concerned about the deep cuts to Medicare in particular, those with Medicare Advantage plans that are going to be hurt. Uh, the physicians themselves, 
they were a loud voice. Um, you know, it's really going to test their willingness to want to provide services to government-run uh, health care programs in the new system. And the taxpayers, you know, you can look at the tanning uh, tax, you can look at all these taxes. The American people realize when you add a tax to a product, it ends up falling on them. It's not that hard to explain to the American people, and they got it. They also see that their future is looking grim. We have massive new spending in the new bill, new entitlements that we know we can't sustain even in the current system. So uh, I think the American people recognize that it was a bad deal for them as well. On the good, on the good front, I think the states were a wonderful um, phase two of the debate. While the bill got enacted at, at the federal level, then this fight really started at the state level. States introduced um, uh, legislation across the country, whether it was to protect their citizens from the individual mandate, the court cases, et cetera. They jumped up and got moving into action to start expressing the views of the citizens in the state back to Washington. Now they took it to the voting booths, but at least the states were engaged um, and focused. I'm, hope, I'm hopeful, as Tom's op-ed had said, that the states continue this, this focus, and not only on pushing back on the federal government, but also pushing back by forging ahead with their own reforms. Forget what the federal government has said. You need to know at the state level what, is, what the citizens in that state need and then pursue reforms at the state level. Force the federal government to say what you're doing doesn't serve the needs of the citizens. I think that's an important um, pressure point that the states need to continue in the, in the next couple years. Um, now we're back, though, that it's Congress's turn. The Congress, as everyone has said, has to immediately pass a repeal bill. I think that's what the American people are now waiting for. I'm waiting to know what day it's going to be. Let's know exactly when it's going to be, and let's take care of it quickly and cleanly, which is just with a full repeal bill. Um, but as it's been noted, um, you know, we have a president that doesn't that seems to have drawn the line that he thinks his his uh, law was pretty good. He did not back away from the health care proposal at all, and I don't think that he got the message from the American people. So until Congress can get the president to accept the repeal, um, it really needs to pursue at every opportunity and, uh, ways to block the implementation of the new law. It's an opportunity now to keep the pressure on, keep this law in the forefront. Three years or two and a half years is a long way away, and people lose attention. We know that with the news cycle and everything else, people's attention goes elsewhere. It is important that the new Congress keep the health care law front and center um, during uh, the next two years. And that can do in a variety of ways, whether it's the vote on a full repeal bill, whether that includes blocking um, the provisions through defunding them, which has been discussed over and over again, but it's an important way, again, of keeping it front and center. Um, legislative delays and triggers, I think Jim mentioned a few of them that I think are very practical. During the markup of these bills as they went through the House and the Senate, let's not forget there were robust amendments that were offered during this markup series, and I think many of those amendments could come back and say, let's now, in a new uh, dynamic in the House especially, let's start discussing you know, how those amendments would come to place. These are delaying amendments, trigger amendments. If this doesn't happen, then X won't go into place. Really start putting people um, on, the, on the record for that, as well as overriding the regulations that are already going into effect. I don't think there's any reason why Congress cannot act to try to um, squeeze back what the administration, in particular the Secretary of HHS, with all her authority to interpret the bill, as John Hoff here in the audience has written a great piece for us on, um, there is a time for her to get reined in and, and the policies um, reined in, and I think Congress has an important job there. As well as pursuing strong oversight, it was noted to me earlier that the Democratic-controlled Congress um, since enactment and has not held one oversight hearing. I think it's, a, it's important for the new Congress to pursue that approach and say, we need to look at oversight. Let's see how things are going. Um, what, what, are the, what are the regulations? How are they being enacted? How are they being decided? I think an aggressive role of oversight is also important. Um, at the same time, Congress needs to kind of chewing gum and walking at the same time I know can be difficult, but it's important that Congress begins a dialogue with the American people and among themselves on what real health care reform is. The American people want health care reform, they just don't like the reform that the Obama administration forced on them, which is a government control, one size fits all approach to health care reform. That's not what the American people want, but we can't forget that we do need health care reform in our country. I think it's important to take the president's proposal and kind of turn it on its head. As Jim said, this bill, there's no tweaking that can be done. You cannot build a consumer-based health care system on a flawed foundation. And there's no reason to try to negotiate with tweaks or fixes 
when the foundation is is unstable. And I also uh, wanted to point out too that it is so critical to remember why we have to almost start from phase one. Not only educating Congress, and I think Jim's comments about building um, coalitions is very important. This isn't a time to pass another 2,000 page bill on day two of a new Congress. This is the time to actually start building support for the long-term reforms that we need in the healthcare system. And uh, we need to start educating members, in particular with so many new members who know they're against the Obamacare, but may not know what, where we want to go in the long term or how to get there. So how can we start educating each other in the Congress and in, in America as well so that there is kind of comfort and a level of trust in when uh, reforms start going into place, what they are and how it can improve the system as a whole. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that. Doug Batcher. Thank you, Hans. Well, um, I've been set up as the guy who will now stomp on the audacity of hope <laughs> and uh, explain to you why none of this will ever happen. Um, I will moderate that a little bit, but just uh, bring in the dose of political reality. I think we, we all know. I was um, worked uh, as a Senate staffer back after the 1994 uh, victories in, in, in Congress. And at the time, uh, the incoming Speaker Newt Gingrich said something to the effect as he talked about the contract with America and launching with, forward with their 100 days agenda. When asked about, well, what about President Clinton, he made the comment that, that, that he would be irrelevant. Um, President Clinton, very much on the defensive, was asked a question at whether or not he was irrelevant by a reporter, and his answer was, the Constitution makes me relevant. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we've heard uh, through all of these presentations the very obvious fact that, you know, whether it's a resolution of disapproval to strike down the grandfather reg, as, 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 as Jim has talked about, uh, whether it's a reconciliation bill where you can make changes to entitlement programs, difficult to establish them, uh, certainly uh, difficult or impossible to establish the mechanisms to administer them, but entitlement programs once in existence can be changed. Subsidies can be delayed, they can be adjusted and so forth, uh, and again passed um, uh, without a super uh, majority in the Senate. Uh, and then, obviously, Congress holds the, the power of the purse and to say that you uh, won't provide money for a comparative effectiveness research or uh, uh, if you, you'll not allow a, uh, a, an independent payment advisory board to be constituted. All of that stuff, uh, of course, uh, can be done. At the same time, there are obvious budget realities. If you do try to restore MA cuts, uh, if you try to repeal the Class Act, believe it or not, uh, despite the fact that even uh, Senator Conrad has called it a Ponzi scheme, in the CBO calculus, those cost the government money. Cost the government money not to have an IPAB uh, because the law establishes a global budget for Medicare. It says that Medicare is only allowed to grow on a per capita basis at a particular rate, and all the IPAB does is um, you know, they write the words and Congress has written the music. How do you then shrink Medicare to fit inside that global budget? And the IPAB's recommendations then carry some sort of uh, super uh, uh, powers that uh, can't really be undone uh, easily by Congress or the president. Uh, you can get rid of the IPAB, but if you try to get rid of the underlying global budgets, that too costs money. So uh, the, one of the real challenges we all face is, in fact, a budgetary challenge that repealing or replacing particular portions of this actually ends up being a, uh, something that uh, increases the deficit. And I'll, I'll return to that in a moment. So there's the veto power. There's the, uh, there are the obvious political realities. And then there are some of the budgetary hurdles that exist. But that said, um, I'm prepared to say that the, um, the glass or the styrofoam cup is at least half full. And, um, and I'm going to talk about three groups that I think will be critical uh, to uh, determining whether this uh, law will go forward as enacted, largely unchanged, or whether substantial changes to it are possible. Uh, the first group that I think is, is very important, um, perhaps key from the Washington perspective anyway, are, are Senate Democrats. Now, generally, if you talk to Democrats over the last few days or even over the last few weeks, as the 
as uh, it became fairly evident this, that Tuesday was not going to be a good day, they fall into three categories. The first, and the one you probably read most about, is the group that absolutely denies that health care had anything to do with what happened on Tuesday. Uh, the results of that election were because of the unemployment rate and solely the unemployment rate. The unemployment rate is attributable to a bad economy, and the bad economy, of course, is attributable to President Bush. So, in effect, Tuesday happened because of President Bush. Um, <laughs> I joke about that, but the, the reality is you need to understand that the peop many of the people that need to be persuaded uh, to take up health care reform again are people who genuinely believe that it did not contribute to Tuesday's debacle. You can't appeal to someone uh, on, uh, you know, like that uh, to try to get them to look at this differently. Then there's the second group who uh, believes that health care had something to do with it, but that it had to do more with the process than the substance. So the last thing you want to do in the 112th Congress is go through health care again. Uh, you, you've, got to, you've got to let that go. And then there are those who believe it does have something to do with substance, that people are genuinely upset about some of the provisions. But there the notion is that, that people on the receiving end of enlightened policy are ungrateful at first, but eventually decide no longer to swim against the tide of history. Give this time, let this go on, let it mature, and, and soon it will be those who opposed health care or sought its repeal who will be suffering politically. Again, that group is not one uh, that, that you can appeal to. And then finally, you have the sort of sense of um, the, the, the justification that's often used in wartime. President Bush used it during the Iraq War. If we were to withdraw now, then all of those people uh, who, who lost their lives will have died in vain. So we need to go forward precisely because things have gone badly. There are Democrats who genuinely look at Speaker Pelosi and the President and others as genuine heroes for having sent their troops off the cliff uh, in the, in, uh, as, as the price to pay for achieving a great progressive victory. And ha that having been done, those losses having been suffered, why on earth would you go back and undo major portions of the victory? So you need to understand the audience to which you have to appeal, which is Senate Democrats, many of them absolutely are not going to be, not going to be listening. But there is the, the fact also of dealing with the aftermath of defeat. You know, uh, week after next, people are going to have to say, hey, Russ, sorry, man, it was a tough year. It wasn't your fault. Blanche, you know, that unemployment rate killed you. It's just, you know, you were wrong place at the wrong time. It's, you know, you need to, you face former colleagues who have, have lost their seats. Uh, you see all these crazy wackos that you've been looking at on cable news and realize they're walking around the halls of the Senate. They're your colleagues now. It's a very daunting kind of, uh, you know, and I worked in the Senate for a number of years at the gym, uh, and, and Nina, I, I mean, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a horrible thing to actually be face-to-face -face with the outcome of a bad election. Uh, it, it, it really plays with your mind. Added to that is the fact that next time around, 24 of the 33 Senate seats are held by Democrats. Um, and when you look in particular at the Senate Finance Committee, there'll be, I don't know, 11 or 12 Democrats on the committee, depending on what they decide on the ratio. Seven of them are up in 2012. Think about Ken Conrad. Um, he's up in 2012. Um, he just watched uh, a, uh, a Governor Hoven be elected Senate virtually without opposition. He watched Earl Pomeroy, who's been a fixture in North Dakota and Washington politics for as long as pretty much anyone can remember, just get trounced in his reelection bid, and he knows that his name will be on the ballot next time around. Folks like that might be 
open to at least thinking about uh, making changes to uh, this bill if, in fact, uh, they, they, they see it as substantive policy, uh, as correct from a matter of policy, but also, but also good politics. So that's one group of people. The other group um, is the uh, folks outside the Beltway. You've heard a lot about the fact that you, uh, many Republicans have swept into the state house as governor. At the state legislative letter, level, literally seven or 800 seats changed hands from Democrats to Republicans. I mean, the state legislatures, uh, as well as the governorships, have, have changed enormously as a result of, of Tuesday's election. And what was already a small group of governors who were resistant to some of this change. And again, the governors have to play, the state legislators have to play in order for this to work and go forward as planned. It's gone from a small group to a much larger group. You think about uh, Mitch Daniels in, in Indiana. As some of you read uh, two weeks ago the, the Wall Street Journal piece by a Democratic governor of Tennessee, uh, uh, Governor Bred Bredesen, who said, look, when this comes around, we're going to dump our state employees into the exchanges. Why would we continue to carry a huge unfunded liability on our books when we can say to the federal government, you're now responsible for subsidizing the, the coverage of, of, of these employees? Now, he was roundly criticized. There were academics who wrote that the governor just didn't understand the math, that it was actually in his interest to continue to provide these benefits. Um, et cetera, but the reality is that governors are actually thinking about this kind of thing, and the new governors, uh, when they look at the uh, Medicaid overhang that they're going to be facing and some of the other costs associated with the new law, may be thinking in very unconventional ways about this. And that brings to the final group that I think is um, a key target audience. Uh, and this is very inside the beltway, but, but, but that is the Congressional Budget Office, um, which may well be getting a new director with the first of the year if, if Congress can agree to uh, replace uh, the existing director whose term expires on January 3rd. See, the, the CBO analysis of, um, of health reform, some of, some of it is mechanical. If you tell the CBO that there are going to be productivity, hospital productivity is going to prove every single year till the end of time, they will plug that into their spreadsheet and tell you you're going to save $300 billion or whatever the number is, okay? 155 over 10 and God knows how much into the future. Now they know that that's impossible. It still takes four people to play a string quartet. Uh, there is a point at which you can no longer improve productivity, but Congress says you will do this they plug it into the spreadsheet, the answer comes out of the other end. Similarly with iPad. If you say that, that the government is only going to allow Medicare to grow at a certain rate, uh, per capita spending to grow at a certain rate, you score that. The fact that you already have a global budget for physician services and Congress never, almost never, allows that global budget to be enforced through automatic cuts in physician payments, you have to look the other way and say, we don't care what's actually happened. Congress has given us this, and we need, to, we need to score it accordingly. But there is at least one assumption that is entirely a construct of the Congressional Budget Office assumption. It is not statutorily mandated, and I would argue flies in the face of common sense. And that is, if you say to employers, um, you can either continue to provide coverage to your employees at increased cost and under, as Jim has pointed out, increasing federal regulation, or you can cash out their benefit, pay a $2,000 per year tax to the federal government and allow the federal government to subsidize it, employers will say, we are going to continue to provide coverage for our employees. Now I submit to you that um, I don't believe that to be the case. And I'm not talking about Microsoft, I'm not talking about the, the, the giants who may or may not continue to provide coverage for brand reasons or for um, uh, people tied into collective bargaining contracts or, or for competitive reasons. 
I'm talking about people that are running small enterprises, 50, 100, 150, 200 employees, um, who are doing, who frankly are doing the math. They are thinking about this. They are looking at the, uh, the flood of regulations that continues to come their way. And they're beginning to do the calculation, as Governor Bredesen did, that it's really not worth it. Uh, we need to, uh, we need to, uh, if the government is willing to subsidize my workers' health care, why don't I allow the government to go ahead and do that and get out of a business that is frankly uh, not going very well for me or my employees in the sense that it's depressing wages? So um, if that mentality becomes more uh, pervasive, if it becomes more apparent, if Congress continually begins to hold hearings and brings employers up and actually talks to them, gets them on the record about the kinds of things they're doing and how they're thinking about it, um, it is conceivable that CBO would alter that assumption. And even a change of 10 percent, if you, if you were to assume 10 percent or 20 percent of employers would, would drop their coverage, when you think about 160 uh, million people on employer-sponsored <laughs> coverage, that becomes a very, very expensive undertaking for the federal government. And what has been scored as a deficit reducer uh, could potentially be scored as something that becomes a very co a yet another costly entitlement and forces Congress to concentrate its mind on that uh, uh, entitlement as they think about long-term uh, deficit reduction. Um, those three, again, the uh, class of 2012 Democrats, the governors and the state legislatures and, and employers and ultimately their impact on the CBO, I think are the potential game changers on the horizon and might create a climate uh, where a substantial change in the health reform law is possible in the new Congress. Doug, thank you. Uh, we didn't have that strong, uh, sharpen elbows uh, on going down the row here, but let me just uh, go down the row and see if anybody wants to either add to something or, or um, clarify something based on something anyone else might have said. Tevi? Uh, yeah, I, I think it was actually a, a very good um, look across the different landscape, what the House Republicans are saying, what some of the people who are outside the groups of, of the House Republicans, like uh, Doug mentioned, the governors and, uh, and CBO, the 2012 Democrats, and also some of the specific reforms uh, that, that can happen. So, so I think that while the uh, the general paradigm I laid out of uh, House Republicans having relatively few options going forward uh, r remains, I think there are a lot of wild cards out there that can change what happens in the next year. Yep. Uh, just want to sort of drive home the point that Doug just made about um, re-estimating the bill. Um, that um, I think the. Uh, Doug Holtz Eakin at uh, the American Action Forum did an estimate of how many people would be better off essentially inside the exchanges as opposed to retaining job based coverage through their current employer. And it turns out that for because the exchanges are providing such huge subsidies uh, to people through, through for insurance, remember that. The, the promise here is that they're going to get everybody between 133 and 400 percent of the federal poverty line is going to get a discount on their insurance premiums through the exchange. That's the entitlement promise that's in the bill. And if you look at census data, how many people are in that income category? It's about 111 million people who are in the category 133 to 400 percent of poverty. That's a lot of people. CBO assumes that about 20 million people are going to end up in the exchange. So where are the other 90 million people? Uh, they assume they'll all stay in the employer-based system. Doug's estimate indicates that if just just the people who would be, you know, most advantaged by being in the exchange as opposed to being in employer plans, that's the lowest wage workers, basically below 250 or 300 percent of poverty. If they end up in the exchange and leave the employer-based system which you can imagine easily happening, employers finding ways to readjust, reorganize how they're doing business. New employers in particular, as they form, will organize themselves explicitly to take advantage of the subsidy. If all that occurs, 
then 35 million people end up in the exchanges. It's another trillion dollars just in the first decade. Okay? Suddenly the bill looks to be more like the gargantuan entitlement explosion that everybody expects it to be if CBO confirms that. So those are the kind of things. That, that, uh, Holt Deacon is the former head of CBO. <clears throat> yes, excuse me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. thank you, Tevi, for that point. Yeah, and Doug has got a lot of credibility because he's the former head of CBO. So these are this, this point by Doug is really, really important. The two Dougs, Doug Holt Badger and Doug Holt Deacon. Um... Let me add something else because I always go where I shouldn't. Um, one of the undiscussed <clears throat> subjects in this area is how to deal with wayward, cheating former allies. Uh, that's the interest group side of this. Uh, and I think that uh, those of you who've had your phones uh, ringing off the hook for the first time in a couple of years know that there's suddenly interest in other ideas. Uh, I would just suggest that it's okay to date again, uh, but don't get married <laughs> and use protection. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. <laughs> Nina? Um, I Just reflecting on what Doug said, I think the important thing to remember, too, is that this is why Congress can't just pass a repeal bill and move on to something else. That this takes a lot of work and a lot of organized efforts, and that the Congress and the new members especially are being held accountable now by the American people. And so the focus needs to be, to be on keeping Congress focused on this health care law and figuring out ways to continue to keep the pressure on so in 2013 a full repeal can happen. And I want Doug Holtzaken to run CBO. <laughs> <laughs> Doug for Doug. Doug, Doug for Doug. Doug, yeah. Let me use the moderator's prerogative to um, put a question to the panel. Maybe start with um, uh, Jim Capretta as our most budget identified person. What struck me about what I heard from the panel was that um, there wasn't much attention to the budget fiscal outlook. Um, there's the, is this a source of action force? Well, this this is has to, it's another story that has to play out. It could play out in parallel. It could have interact with the scenarios that that you've um, outlined here. Um, certainly, there are a bunch of physicians who want to know about um, that that payment um, cut that's sort of looming out there, that guillotine that's about to fall on them. Um, how are that those factors going to inter uh, interplay with the scenarios that we've heard about so far here this morning, Jim? Well, uh, the. Uh if there's anything that's clear out of the election, it's that the, the public wants the new Congress, 112th Congress, to rein in government spending. I mean, I think if there's any mandate out of the election, it's that they, there's a, a very sizable portion of the public that understands that the federal government is doing way too many things, spending way too much money. And so there's there's going to be a lot of members in the new in the new Congress who come there rightfully with a um, the view that their voters have sent them there with pretty explicit instructions to do what they can to begin examining every item in the government to cut back on spending, and that includes health care. Now, having said that, um, the the fiscal outlook is you know complicated by by the fact that uh, we have. Uh, we're in a very slow recovery, and so they're going to need to have sort of a dual program here, that, which is to make sure that <clears throat> the long, the medium and long-term fiscal outlook improves by eliminating unnecessary government spending. At the same time, they're promoting through um, less regulation, lower taxes, job growth and entrepreneurial activity in the American economy. And they can be pursued simultaneously, uh, but they, it will be a, a trick to kind of pull that all together into a coherent package. Now, how does that affect health care? I think health care and entitlement reform are kind of, kind of in a parallel track, frankly. Um, I think that the... the um, my, my own judgment, as I said in my opening remarks, is that we are on the cusp of, you know, we need to do major entitlement reform in this country. Um, but that only is going to occur if a president, I think, is elected who explicitly puts that to the public and says that it's a time for us to take these reforms extremely seriously because the clock is ticking. And I see the 2012 presidential election as being a decisive moment, uh, whether or not the public will go along with a uh, 
reordering of the of some of the major structures of our entitlement programs for long-term fiscal policy or if the other alternative is uh, a very substantial tax increase being imposed on the public five or ten years from now uh, those are essentially the two choices and the 2012 election could be quite decisive in determining which one actually takes place so you see being able to muddle through the next two years without the budget kind with with this budget track and health care reform staying on separate stacks and asbestos wall remaining between them two health care uh, no the, pretense to sort the, of suck in well the uh, big money the big money entitlement reforms and health care reforms i see being a, a guerrilla war as heavy described it being decided that some big action will occur after the 2012 election i don't think anything big will happen on those fronts before 2012 but the new congress will pursue lots of other budget cutting that they can advance maybe even get some traction with including in the senate still opposed by the president very likely but of you know discretionary spending size and scope of government the bureaucracy um there there's lots of targets here for cutting back the size and scope of government that are not necessarily you know medicare uh health entitlement or tax policy. Anything else you want to jump in before we go to questions? Uh, I just want to oh, make one yes. quick, oh, one quick point on okay. that. Right. Uh, by, by Jim. But if you look at it, if you want to make changes in, in the health care bill, almost everything in the bill is uh, board by CBO as a cost saver except for the subsidies and the exchange. So what they try to do is jam in all these different things that are so-called pay for it. I'm not sure all the pay for are, are actual pay for in, in the real world. But making changes to the health care bill is exchanges, but it is expensive and puts real pressure on the Republicans who are going to be trying budget cutting. And CBO is going to be seen as the watchdog, especially since Republicans were happy and gleeful to cite CBO from the last Congress about every time they said that the health care bill was cost of money. So it is going to be an additional hit. Jim or Th Thomas? Just on, on that point, I do think the Republicans can rightfully couple anything they do to delay some of the bad elements of the bill, if they supposedly cost money, uh, by coupling it with delay in the new spending provision. Um, Just on the, the larger economic picture, I mean, we're all presuming, you know, don't underestimate the, 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 the synergy between a bad economy and uh, the reactions to the health care bill. If you were in an era of, you know, 5% real growth with a bounce back, all things seem possible, even though they're not down the road. Which was, I think, the era of when Medicare got enacted, right? By exactly. It, it, yes. Exactly. So, you, you know, a, a rising tide makes you forget where the water really is. Um, <laughs> in addition to, you, you know, I, I think we're presuming that we're going to have, you know, minimal slow growth for another two years. Based on current policies, I'd agree. <laughs> uh, but that's, un that, 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 that's almost a historical. Uh, the other side of this, though, is more of an action-forcing event, is not to think of it domestically, but a march and call international. And you don't know when things change around in terms of international currency markets and our current creditors as to when too much is, is, is too much. Um, the other larger wild card, although we're, we're playing short-term politics, is we don't know what tax code we might have in a couple of years. Uh, there's a lot that's going to get back on the table. They may not agree to anything. But at some point, I think the old uh, existing trench lines of the, the tax code are going to get changed. And when that swapping happens, uh, there's a lot more dealing back and forth in, in that regard. On the hope for a, uh, a great referendum in the 2012 election, I haven't seen uh, the candidate endorsing, here's some tough medicine for you, and I'm going to lay it out yet. We need to do some work in that regard. Uh, but never underestimate the ability to say just enough without saying anything more, even by those who are, uh, are, are well intended. We also have a lot of support for aggregate reductions in spending, but not support for structurally how to do it. And this is a standard problem. First, you set up the formula and say, let's take it out, and then we'll figure it out later on. But when you parse it into the particular pieces, it's much tougher sledding, as, as Jim knows, because he's been directly involved in it. Uh, Nobody commented on the uh, doc fix and this, you know, merry-go-round in that regard. My quick comment would be some leaders of organized medicine and their bargaining on this uh, made the Indians who sold Manhattan look like better dealers. Didn't see anybody, uh, Nina or, or Doug, before we go to the audience? No. All right. 
uh, questions out here for our panel or things that uh, provocative thoughts or statements that you would like to uh, respond to. Behind you. Uh, Ryan, Ryan Caldar. My question for the panel is, what what happens to the individual mandate with uh, Republican takeover of uh, the House uh, in terms of the risk pool? If you have guaranteed issue, get rid of the individual mandate, which has been done in several states. What what happens to the risk pool? Yeah, I, I think that's a a very good question. We're, there's been a lot of focus, of course, on the lawsuits, and I think everyone expects them to go to the Supreme Court, uh, but. It's, it's hard to find uh, a provision with more bipartisan opposition than the individual mandate. Um, some of you may have seen Michael Moore commenting recently that, that he views the requirement to, to buy private health insurance as uh, equivalent to, a, to tolerating slavery, that uh, all you're doing is uh, lining the pockets of insurance companies that are uh, exploiting people and, and, and uh, making these uh, great profits. On the conservative side, of course, you've got the folks who say, wait a minute, the government doesn't have the legal authority, the constitutional authority, to require people to buy something if they don't want to buy it. Um, and um, one of the things that could happen in the new Congress is that those folks might find each other. Um, it's, it's, it's certain that the administration would, would perhaps raise objections to this because of the sort of theory as you lay out that the whole thing only holds together as long as people are required to do something they would not otherwise be inclined to do particularly younger healthier people for whom it's probably a bad buying a, a health insurance is probably a bad economic decision with respect to how they use relatively scarce resources um, and it's probably true you saw what happened in the child only market when the government in effect made up a guaranteed issue requirement that wasn't in the law, combined it with a pre-existing condition requirement that was, and all of a sudden insurers said, well, thank you, but we just won't sell child-only policies any longer. So the repeal of the individual mandate, I, I think, would in fact be disruptive. I don't know how CBO would score it. They probably would say premiums would go up, which would mean subsidies would go up, which would mean, uh, I, I don't know. I have no idea how they would do it. Uh, but um, politically, the individual mandate, the, 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 the penalty, the tax on people for the privilege of remaining uninsured is something that I, uh, I, I, I think is, could be hard to sustain if in fact it were put to a vote. I agree with that and I also think that uh, don't assume that this would be a, uh, something that would increase the cost of the bill. I, I think actually it will be the opposite. The reality or in CEO I, world. And Jim knows CBO better than I do, so I, I defer, defer to your judgment. If it's a saver, that would, of course, give it even more of a political, political uh, lift. Well, we, we're presuming that the individual mandate will actually exist and actually be enforced and actually right. come into play. Uh, I think the fallback position is a sense of the Congress resolution saying we think it would be a good idea for you to buy insurance. Hope you do. <laughs> um, it, 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 there's a lot of hurdles in terms of actually making this, you know, take hold. That's why it was put further out as opposed to, to right away. Um, the other thing is it's so tied and woven in to the rest of this complex construct that when you pull that apart, you wonder why you're doing all those other stupid things. Uh, they're all you know interrelated and each one bootstraps the other, but the individual mandate remains the most vulnerable whether or not uh, it goes down in the court challenge. And I think politicians, uh, three, four years from now, if it actually means something, doesn't mean a whole lot, even with the penalties right now, uh, would be prone to rethink that. Other question? Hi, I'm Sarah Cliff with Politico. Thanks for having this. I was wondering, you know, you've all talked about we're definitely going to see a repeal vote on day one. What does the timeline look like after that? Are there certain things that come? Before, you know, other things, certain amendments you see being offered first on different provisions, kind of different oversight things will happen sooner rather than later. I'm just wondering if there's a past day one kind of timeline. If there is, I don't know it. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, there are some things I think that have been mentioned, uh, but pr particular features of the bill that are unpopular. 
the 1099 requirement, for example, that that you know could come up. I think which the I, president himself sort of raised yesterday in yeah. his press conference, saying, "Well, I, I that's something I could see changing." I think the business of not being able to use your flexible spending account to buy over-the-counter drugs again, people will begin to see that and and be a little upset about it, and 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 that's one that I don't know, it's 12 billion or whatever, but. Um, you know that 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 might be vulnerable, and then uh, Senator Enzi, of course, uh, filed a resolution of disapproval uh, on the grandfather proposal, the thing that uh, the the thing that Jim talked about. The 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 law specifically grants grandfather status to employers who had plans in effect on March 23rd. There is absolutely not one word in that law about how anyone loses that status. Uh, the business of losing your grandfather status is an, an entirely a regulatory construct and one done through an interim final rule, not even a notice and comment rulemaking. Um, again, on the theory of if you like what you have, you can keep it, a resolution of disapproval uh, I, I think might have a chance. They took a preliminary motion to proceed vote on it, but I think it can be brought back up. Um, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see that. Again, that's considered under expedited procedures in the Senate. Can't be amended. Can't be uh, can't be filibustered. And if a bill, if a resolution like that were to end up on the president's desk, he could veto it. But but I'm not sure it would be a terribly popular decision on his part. Also, seems like there'll be prioritization within the committees themselves and their jurisdiction. So, you know, taking it to the floor is one level, but I think that there'll be a push across, um, not just on the floor, but what are the committees going to create as a priority for the next year, and what are their interests in in particular, um, and linking it to with the timeline of when provisions go into. It. Uh, just one more point on that, for, and thank you, Sarah, for the shout out and pulse this morning. Um, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I think there might be a two track approach uh, on this that um, I, I think you're going to see initially this sort of guerrilla warfare that I laid out with um, the a lot of um, investigations and hearings and a, a sort of a gung ho approach on that stuff again after the initial symbolic repeal. And then if there's a sense that maybe we need a, a broader list of accomplishments going into the 2012 election. You might see a rethinking in, of the strategy and more substantive provisions that potentially could get bipartisan support and potentially even President Obama's signature in a second year. Up front here. Front. Jerry. Uh, wait, wait for the mic so our webcasting audience can hear you too. Thank you. Uh, Jerry Norris with the Hudson Institute. A uh, question. Uh, during the one of the most thirty-three. This was played over. We knew the number, but it was never broken. And when you do break. Well, Jerry, I, I think it's a good question. It's actually, um, Tom, I think, alluded to the small bill that Jeff and Anderson and I had been promoting, and, then, and that's what we try and do is try and, try and check, um, break it down to, to that most in, injured, indigent number. And, of course, remember, the most indigent folks are, are eligible uh, for, for Medicaid. So, yes, the, the, and the number of uninsured was, uh, you said, 33 million. There was also 47 million was said at one point. President Obama was saying 47 for a while, and then he switched to 30. Uh, the new bill would cover 32 million, according to CBO, by 2019. Let's, let's go with, with that figure. But there are a lot of different subcategories within that 32 million. Some of them are illegal immigrants. Some of them are sort of the um, the, the young and healthies, the people who are, are choosing not or had been choosing not to purchase health insurance because they think it's not a good deal for them. And then, of course, the, there are the, the people who are kind of the working poor. And I think that's what the bill, or, uh, a bill should really target, which is the working poor who still can't afford health insurance. I, I think if we want to have a, a repeal, I think it needs to hit those people. And just to stress, too, that the bill itself doesn't eliminate the uninsured. I think that's something that needs to be reminded, that this bill doesn't cure the problem of the uninsured in the country. So even on, um, on their own standards, they're falling far short. By 20 million, 20 million yeah. uninsured in uh, 2000. 
Anyone else? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Hi, Phil Galowitz with Kaiser Health News. Just to follow up on that point. So as you mentioned, um, CBO said the law would give uh, coverage to 32 million Americans. Uh, would the Republicans need to come anywhere close in terms of a replacement bill? I mean, would covering three million be enough to replace, or what? Would, would anything that would be offered to replace have to come anywhere close to 32 million? And could you also touch on some of the provisions that have proven somewhat popular in in some of the polling, uh, getting rid of pre-existing conditions, uh, provisions with insurers? Most Americans say that's a good idea. Uh, eliminating uh, costs for prevention in Medicare. Most seniors seem to like that. Uh, can you touch on those more popular provisions and if they'll see um, those staying in any way? Well, this is uh, the president. If you listened to the president yesterday, they, they, every time the bill comes up now, they always go back to, well, we have these provisions in the bill that are really popular. If everybody's mandated to have coverage up to age 26, that seems to be something that everybody, everybody likes. Is it really that something everybody likes? Is, I mean, is the public that? Um, uh, I, I think it's really false to assume the public can't digest more than one piece of information. Yes, they. someone presents to them a piece of information that says, hey, would you like everybody up to age 26 to be part of this health care coverage? You're going to get some portion of the public saying, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Would you like that in a trillion dollar bill with $700 billion in taxes and the federal government running insurance regulation from HHS at 200 Independence Avenue? The answer is no. So, I mean, you know, trying to isolate as this you know, hey, if we just passed pre-existing conditions for children, maybe the president actually could have got that bill. But that's not what he wanted. So this is really a false argument. This is a phony diversion from what's really being debated. Should the federal government essentially run the entire health system uh, from HHS? That's really a lot of what the debate is about. And the bill would push heavily in that direction, and the public rejected that overwhelmingly. Now, um, in a replacement program, do I think it has to be credibly addressing the real issues of the uninsured? Absolutely. I do think so. Um, but I don't think you need to erect anything close to what they did in 2010 to do that. I think there's been some confusion in the polling. I think most people think that the administration had eliminated pre-existing conditions rather than exclusions for pre-existing conditions. So there's a lot of support that you'll never have a medical condition once again. It was a rather <laughs> remarkable accomplishment. Uh, the large problem which Jim is talking about is this is not an a la carte order where you just get to kind of take a few items off the menu uh, that you like and you don't have to swallow the rest of what they're serving up for you in that regard. Uh, on the insurance coverage, uh, what we're drifting toward, which is the reality, is you know what you said is your standards as to what is good enough coverage. Uh, you either have something that uh, moves the minimum up so high uh, that it becomes unsustainable, or you default to the equivalent of Medicaid for all. Uh, and the, one of the reasons why we have all those people who aren't enrolled in Medicaid is they don't like it and they don't want it. They've gone into witness protection and hiding in order not to get covered. So the idea that we can wave our hands and simply cover them by saying, now you're in Medicaid, uh, is, is subject to a little bit of feedback from people saying, where's my insurance? We had one hand over here. We'll come back and make that our, our final question. Hi, I'm Rebecca Adams with CQ. Um, it sounds as if given that Obama does wield the veto pen and uh, given that a lot of the changes would cost money, then what I'm hearing is that it would be very difficult to make really substantive changes before 2012, and it's more a case of building the case for the presidential election. I just want to make sure you all kind of weigh in on that and make sure I'm hearing that correctly. Um, and, and secondly, I'm wondering about the impact of the Deficit Commission in terms of building the case and what you might see in terms of um, votes during the reconciliation process that might build the case as well. If, if I might address the first question, um, uh, although I'm the panel's designated naysayer, uh, I am not saying that uh, substantial changes to the law are out of the question prior to 2012. Um, I'm saying that there are formidable barriers to doing that, many of them constitutional, given the, the President's uh, commitment to implementation of the law, many of them political, uh, given just the current state of affairs uh, in, 
in, t in this town where it's difficult to do bipartisan things. But I'm also saying that uh, there are potential game changers out there. One is uh, the uh, approach that uh, moderate Democrats, the, particularly on the Senate side, particularly those in cycle on 2012 take. Secondly, what the governors will be doing, and if I might suggest when from the perspective of health reform, the most significant uh, place to be on the week of November 15th will not be here in Washington as new leaders are elected and chairmen uh, and chairman uh, pick. It will be in San Diego, a much more pleasant place, uh, when the Republican Governors Association is meeting because I do expect this to be a hot topic and uh, governors begin to talk about what their approach will be uh, to some of these implementation questions. And finally, I'm, I'm suggesting that a combination of uh, employers who remain very dissatisfied uh, with this bill uh, and are increasingly inclined to get out of the health care business, uh, to what extent that becomes pervasive and evident and how the Congressional Budget Office responds to uh, that, that change. If this bill is, as Doug Holtzaken has suggested and Jim has mentioned, uh, if this bill is seen as adding a trillion dollars to uh, the debt over the next 10 years, um, and CBO puts that in writing, um, I, I, I think there will be some real uh, focus on, uh, on the new law. So I'm, not, I'm saying it's not, <laughs> it's not likely, it's very difficult to do, but there are uh, some factors that could make it more likely in spite of those formidable obstacles. And to add on that quickly, uh, I would just say that um, it is clear that there are a lot of obstacles, and I think that's what we've all talked about. And for that reason, when I've talked to House and Senate leadership staffers, I've heard this phrase of building the case, and that is going to be something that they're going to be doing. But that doesn't mean they're giving up on the possibility of getting something. And yes, it's difficult to get stuff done in, in Washington, but anything worthwhile, you really need to push for, and it requires hard work. And from the Democrats' perspective, that's why they worked so hard to get this bill passed, because they knew it would be hard to undo it. So uh, I, I don't think that there's a sense of Republicans giving up in any way because of the structural difficulties. I think it's they recognize they have to build the case and continue to build the case, because they obviously built the case uh, for Tuesday's election, and then work to get stuff done down the road. Part of building the case is target practice. Uh, these things don't work the first time out. Uh, it's one thing to have a quick speech and a postcard that says we're in favor of this thing. It's another thing to mark up the legislation. It's another thing to find what it actually looks like in reality. And many of these things don't come out the first time the way they're designed. Uh, there's often a two to five to ten year history before substantive change in underlying law. Uh, so it's good to get started rather than remaining uh, kibitzing on the sidelines. On the, uh, medic, on the uh, debt commission, I mean, I think it's important to recognize the Debt Commission, uh, 12 of the 18 uh, members were appointed by the president and the Democratic leadership. So you have two-thirds of the panel were appointed by uh, the Democrats. Let me just say, I find that unlikely that that, that, that will produce a report that will be um, uh, viable in the uh, new House. Tammy said we have one enthusiastic question remaining on the side, and then we'll make that the last. And, and, and our panelists can keep that in mind as they have any things they want to add on topic or off topic as we close. Sure. Hi, Blue Ar uh, Drew Armstrong from Bloomberg News. Um, and this is going to pivot off for, uh, uh, Rebecca's question to an extent. I mean, to what, um, to what extent right now do Republicans, given the split nature of Congress, have a responsibility to govern on health care uh, as opposed to, you know, as Tom was saying, building a case? Um, where, where is the responsibility? And, and I'll turn to put that in context of uh, Leader McConnell's comments uh, today, I guess, where he said that, you know, it's all about, it, to an extent, it's about leading up to 2012, but you need the president. I mean, where is the split between governing and building opposition? And to what extent do you think people are expecting results? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure that's a fair characterization of what Leader McConnell said. I mean, he was asked about that initial comment that he made a, a, a week ago, I believe, about, um, now, our goal is to make sure President Obama's one term presidency. But I think today he uh, elaborated on those comments and said, here are the things we want to accomplish. And he listed the things he wanted to accomplish. And he said, all of those things, we think it 
likely that President Obama will veto, and that's why, if he does so, that's why we want to ma make it a one-term presidency. So I think I think his comments were a little more uh, nu nuanced today, and um, and there is a recognition that there's a responsibility that, that Republicans are going to have to govern, and that um, and that there, there were certainly some uh, deficiencies the last time. Uh, Republicans took over with, with great promise back in '94. So, so I, I think there is going to be a sense and understanding. And if you look at responsible legislators, I mean, you you can almost see a picture of John Boehner. I mean, John Boehner obviously was in the leadership the last time after uh, the '94 revolution, lost his spot in leadership, and said, "You know what? I'm going to work as a behind-the-scenes legislator and get stuff done and build my way way back." So I think he's shown that he really has a kind of long-term planning perspective. And, and understand strategy and, and how to get stuff done, and, and that's what got him back to where he is today. I'd also point out that the, the Republicans are actually in a strange position. Uh, in a parliamentary system, one is either in the opposition or one is in the government, uh, and that certainly uh, the Republicans were solely in the opposition for the last two years. Now they're in the ambivalent position of not only do we have divided government between the executive and legislative branches, but we have a divided Congress. Uh, where uh, one body is under control of, of, of the other. And so uh, Republicans find themselves in, a, in, an ambivalent, uh, uh, in an ambivalent place. They can't simply govern under, under the rules of the game and under, under, the con uh, under the Constitution. I will say, however, that Democrats and Republicans read the election results very, very differently. Democrats do not see the electorate or substantial portions of the electorate registering their opposition to implement implementing the health care bill as passed. They simply do not see that. Many Republicans, on the other hand, ran on repeal and replace and believe that their obligation to the electorate is to, in fact, uh, make substantial changes to, uh, to the health, prepare, uh, health reform uh, bill. There is a very, very different point of view coming from the two parties, neither of which has complete control over the process. As a result, I think what you're hearing from some on the panel is to say, how does a not quite governing majority in one body um, function as a successful opposition and find out a, find a way given the uh, political and, and uh, uh, constitutional circumstances in which they find themselves, to progress toward a goal that they believe voters have elected them to achieve. Uh, so it's a tricky position, and I, I think far more complex and nuanced than, than your question may have, may have captured. And for the short term, at least for the next two years, Republicans will still uh, have the advantage of uh, suffering from the soft bigotry of low expectations. Uh, they have to try. They don't have to succeed if they try seriously. It's inevitably the fact in, in, in national politics. The president gets more credit than he deserves all the time and also occasionally more blame than he deserves. But the referendum after two years will be primarily on the person in charge at the White House, hmm. as opposed to all those folks yapping and saying different things uh, in Congress that doesn't have a particular uh, face to it. Uh, as to the responsibility of governing, uh, based upon some of the accomplishments of past Republican Congresses, I'm not sure if we want them <laughs> to fully succeed in a serious <laughs> governing sense. We'll make that the uh, last word. Thank you for coming today. Thank you to our panel. and uh, the. The entire thing will be ar web archived on Hudson's website, including Tom Miller's wonderful slides. And we'll come check back in two years whether we were prophets or fools. Tom, always funny.